Thank you very much. Thank you. Very kind. Thank you. Thank you very, very, very much. You can imagine how exciting it is for me to be here at the Clinton School because of the multiple dimensions, if you will, of a day like today. One of them is to be introduced by a young man like Jacob Perry, who is a graduate of the school, who has already distinguished himself in public service, and who now is associated with what we're calling the Cisneros Center for New Americans. He joins other fellows. They are here. I don't know whether they've been introduced, but if they haven't, I'd like to. Jessica Boyd, if you could please stand. And Jennifer Aguirre, if you would stand. And, and Jacob, these three are the, uh, the, the first group of Cisneros Fellows that are deployed into the first place we've sent anyone, which is Northwest Arkansas. And I'm very proud of them. And two of the three are graduates of the Clinton School. <laughs> we, had, uh, we had something like 70 applicants, and they were all top quality young people. We're not after young people who are immediately out of college. We want a couple of years of experience with organizations like Teach for America or charter schools where they have been sent into a community and have to show that they're self-reliant. Uh, they've been told us essentially, go build something, go create a program, and they've done it. And these are the persons who were selected out of those 70. We think they're the best of class. And, and uh, we didn't have a criteria that they should be from Arkansas, nor that they should be from the Clinton School. It just worked out that way. Uh, because they're literally with the best of the group. And it's a very exciting thing to see them on the ground operating. I'll talk more about what we're doing with our center in Northwest Arkansas. Uh, the program nationally is headed by Nick Perilla, who is here. Nick, if you could stand, let me recognize you. And Carrie, would you please stand also as well? Great. So that's one dimension of what this means to me today. The other is to be at the Clinton School with Skip Rutherford and uh, the team here at the school. I've been here before, spoken here before to classes. Uh, once you're in the Clinton family, you're in for life. And so it's, uh, whether it's here or whether it's the Clinton Global Initiative or whether it's the library or whether it's a regathering of some of the members of his cabinet or whether it's just being the wonderful friend that he is uh, to uh, uh, you know, come to events that some of us have put on across the country. Uh, it's just a wonderful association uh, to be part of the, the long-term Clinton legacy, and I'm very, very proud of that. Um, I have watched the advent of other presidential schools. I'm a graduate of the Kennedy School in Boston. Uh, I live in San Antonio, which is a sister city to Austin, and there is the LBJ School. And I've been to most of the presidential libraries. I'm a graduate of Texas A&M, and that's the Bush School. Uh, so it's a treat to come once again and see the maturation. I note that we will have the celebration in a few weeks of the 10th anniversary of that very rainy day on which the Clinton School opened, and we all got soaked. I don't think I've ever been as wet as I was that day. Uh, but uh, what, a, what a wonderful uh, thing it is. And to see both the uh, figurative significance of this school as well as its literal strength. And I use that differentiation because some of what the Clinton School does is touch lives in profound ways, like these young people. But I also was present uh, was one of three or four people who stayed up until three o'clock in the morning, uh, the morning of the president's second inauguration, writing the speech, uh, which we finally got to see the president literally at three in the morning <laughs> to go over it with him for the first time. And the theme, as you'll recall, was the bridge to the future because that was 1996 and we were looking at that period, 97, 98, 99, that would take us to 2000. And it was that imagery we were trying to come up with at that point. And the library itself then was developed architecturally with a view toward creating a kind of a bridge imagery. So there's all kinds of things that, you know, this uh, harkens back for me. And finally, most importantly, is President Clinton himself just an extraordinary human being. 
Uh, I had the privilege, I've had the privilege of knowing him since about 1986 or so. I was mayor of San Antonio. He was governor of Arkansas. We're a big convention city, and he was a regular in town speaking to the National Association of this or the Southwest Association of that. And uh, then he took to inviting me to Arkansas. And one occasion, uh, I, I, I got to Little Rock, and they had a small plane lined up for Hillary and I had to fly around to Arkansas cities, to Hot Springs, to Texarkana, to other places around the state, looking at health-related initiatives that she was interested in and that I'd had some role in, in Texas. So I knew from early on, 86, again, 89, that time frame, uh, that she was working on these matters that would eventually uh, become her preoccupation as first lady running the National Health Care Initiative, for example. Uh, so these are wonderful people I've known for a long time. Uh, I left a position uh, serving as a member of the board of the Federal Reserve Bank out of Dallas <clears throat> to campaign in 1992, because you can't be on the Fed and, and be in a political campaign. And then in, at, toward the end of the, of, the, of the campaign, this was August, September, Warren Christopher and Vernon Jordan said to me, we need to put together the beginnings of the presidential transition. Now, I didn't realize what a immense gargantuan task it is organizing a presidential transition, or that you start as early as August, September, when you don't know for sure whether you're gonna win in November. But the truth of the matter is, if you don't do it that early, you cannot be ready to assume the presidency because the job is that large and it takes that long. So they asked four or five of us, the governor of uh, Vermont, uh, Madeline Kunin, myself, Vernon Jordan, Warren Christopher, and um, um, who was it? There was a fifth person that, that was on the transition advisory entity and I spent a lot of time in Little Rock after that uh, because we met over here in one of the downtown office buildings before election day. And one of my most vivid memories of Little Rock is coming in here the day after the election. The president had been on a campaign swing on a plane that I hooked onto in the Valley of Texas and then went through San Antonio, Dallas, Fort Worth, Denver. We, we, we got to Denver about two in the morning before election day uh, in a hangar and I, that beat will resonate in my ears for the rest of my life. Fleetwood Mac singing, don't stop thinking about tomorrow. Don't stop thinking about tomorrow. Beautiful. And then I jumped off the plane because the last stop for him was back in here about six or seven o'clock in the morning to end his presidential campaign here in Little Rock that morning. So he wins that day. And the next day, uh, this group assembled to sit with him for the first time and talk about his dream accomplished, actually having become elected President of the United States and the beginnings of the talk of how to assemble an administration. He was utterly exhausted that day. He was as close to uh, a, 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 an unconscious, conscious person that I have ever seen sitting in a lazy boy recliner in the governor's mansion, but being forced to begin to think about who's gonna be the White House Chief of Staff and who's gonna be the key members of the assistance to the president and the first cut at who some of the cabinet positions gonna be, et cetera. And somewhere in that several days of process, uh, Vernon Jordan said to me, what do you wanna do in the administration? And I said, well, I, I didn't do this because I wanted a position. I, I was just honored to be involved, but I have a, a company that I've got and I've got a, be attentive to it for family reasons. And he said, well, you better think hard because he's gonna ask you to do something and you need to know what you wanna do. So I did think about it. Vernon encouraged me, Warren Christopher encouraged me. And I had been in Los Angeles the night of the riots in April of 1992. You may remember those uh, riots in South Central after the Rodney King verdict. And, um, uh, I was uh, with Mayor Bradley, who was despondent, watching his city burn. And uh, he, he asked myself, and you may know the actor, Eddie James Almost, 
to try to keep the Latino community uh, calm because the chances were that that riot was gonna spill over into Latino neighborhoods and become a conflagration across all of the southern part of Los Angeles. So we literally walked the streets for two days trying to calm people and the sense that the country was in real trouble was embedded in my mind. So when the president did ask me and said, what do you wanna do? Even though as mayor, I hadn't thought much of the Department of Housing and Urban Development, I stayed as far away from it as I could because it was an entanglement uh, of federal bureaucracy. I said, well, if I'm gonna do it, something, it would have to be something that I can wake up every morning and know we're doing this for the right reason and we can make a difference. And so I would do the Department of Housing and Urban Development if you asked me. And he said, well, I'm asking you. And uh, right here in Little Rock, one day we settled a question and it was one of the greatest uh, times for me. I love this country as all of you do. And I visited every single one of the 50 states on the job and 200 different cities on the job. And many of those cities, many, many times, like Chicago, where we took over the Chicago Housing Authority, and, and, and New Orleans, where the Housing Authority was in meltdown, and Philadelphia, which had severe urban problems, um, Atlanta. Uh, so some of those were you know, places I visited 20 times uh, and really got to understand the, the feel, the scale, the length and breadth of our country. And President Clinton gave me that opportunity. Um, he is a wonderful human being, one of the, as you know, one of the smartest people uh, in our country with a tremendous empathy and sense of, of people. Uh, he puts himself in the place of other people and sees the world through their eyes in order to be able to communicate with them effectively. So the long and short is I'm very happy to be here today at the Clinton School of Public Service. Congratulations to all of you associated with such a great American institution. I'm also pleased to be here to say a few words about immigration because I think it's an exceedingly important subject. And even though uh, a good deal of the conversation about immigration in our country today is about immigration laws, I think there's another dimension that we don't talk enough about, and that is immigration and the way it works in communities on the ground. And I want to focus my remarks today on the subject of immigrant integration into the mainstream of American life, which I think is the, the conversation we need to have as soon as we get through some of these technical issues and legal issues in immigration reform. But let me first just say a, a general word about immigration. It's common to talk about the United States as an immigrant nation. But what is less common is a recognition that immigration is at the core of the greatness of our country. It is immigration that provides the country its enterprising spirit, its striving dynamism of refreshed energy of people struggling and striving to get ahead in life, its rich intercultural blend its creative interplay of ideas and music and food and fashion and architecture that makes the country so interesting, its family stories, its youthful energies, its entrepreneurial successes. You could name industries in technology and hospitality and biosciences and engineering in retailing and study their origins and what you would find is that many of America's leading companies are founded or driven by immigrants. Uh, and and they, they uh, are a dynamic addition to the richness of our nation. But beyond all of these sort of positive attributes, there are some, there are some, some, some other reasons why we ought to care deeply about immigration. And one of them is that immigration serves as an antidote to demographic patterns that would otherwise change the country in some very negative ways. If we, if we weren't an immigrant country, if we didn't have this infusion of rich immigrant talent. Today we have some 40 million people over 65 years of age in America. We are a country that is aging very rapidly. That number 40 million will grow to 80 million by 2040. It'll double. We have about 
6 million people under 85 years of age. In the same time frame, that number will triple. We're going to go from 6 million to 20 million people over 85 years of age. This is a dynamic that is, addressed, that is occurring in all of the wealthier northern industrial nations. They're all aging because people are living longer. We've eradicated diseases that killed people earlier. Smoking, for example, uh, is declining. Tuberculosis, people don't die from it. We've actually reduced the mortality rate of a lot of cancers and heart disease. So people live longer. That's one, one dynamic. Uh, and uh, we're actually having fewer children. So the country is becoming older and a greater proportion of the country and the workforce is persons of advanced age. In some countries in the world, this is a very serious issue. Japan, for example, some of you know this, is now declining in population. It's actually becoming smaller. It's losing population. Why? Because it has this aging dynamic. It's the oldest population in the world because it's a very prosperous country. People could get, get good health care and so forth. But it is not, it has no immigrant tradition. To be Korean in Japan, to be Chinese in Japan, to be Filipino in Japan is to be a decidedly second class citizen. They discourage them. They have names for them that separate them from the rest of the population. And so Japan is confronting a reality as a smaller country of how it addresses markets. How does a free enterprise system work? A, si a system based on growth work in a country that is both declining and getting older so that its older population is a greater economic burden, if you will, on the society. It's not just Japan. Russia is getting smaller. Portugal, Spain, France, Germany, all of these places that have no immigrant tradition. The French, for example, are now struggling to allow uh, immigrants from their colonial past, Morocco and Algeria, for example, and confronting serious questions because they don't have a good system of immigrant integration. Germany, same thing. They import workers from Turkey and have immense issues. Even China is a country that's growing a good bit older. In 2040, the United States will have grown from 306 million in the last census of 2010 to 400 million people. We're going to grow by almost 100 million people, right? That'll get us to 400 million. China in that time frame will have 400 million people over 65 years of age. That's how fast China is aging. And it's a function of their one child policy where they didn't have replacement and yet encountering what other countries are in terms of an aging population. So immigration is a hugely important dynamic in, in our country's growth. We're going to have issues, to be sure, problems, but not the problem of growth, not the problem of a replacement population, not the problem of a youthful population because of immigration. Immigrant families tend to be larger. Immigrant families tend to have more children. Now the question is, we know that the immigrant population is going to be large, the minority population is going to be large. But the question is, is it going to be large, undereducated, undercompensated, alienated, a negative in the American future? Or is it going to be large, the source of youthful energy, the source of creative new ideas? And I'm an optimistic person. I, I view these things optimistically. I think it is possible to say, hard to imagine in the, in the, in the, in the, in the contentious cauldron of politics that we live in today and all the negativism in our society, it is hard to say, but I believe you could say America's best days are yet ahead because we've unleashed opportunity for so many people, women who never had an opportunity, disabled persons who never had opportunity, and yes, ethnic minorities who have opportunities as never before. I'm an optimistic person about this, but in my sober moments, I have to say, the nickel is still in the air. The jury is still out because we haven't figured out how we're going to integrate these immigrants in the ways that matter in our educational system, in the development of talent and so forth. So that 
hopefully gives you a sense of why this is such an important theme. It is important, and as a result, it's become a major focal point in our politics. We're stuck on the question of immigration reform. Immigration reform for the last decade has meant basically a three-legged stool. One piece is defense of the border, secure borders, et cetera. So the whole strategy associated with a sovereign country being able to say who comes into the nation, right? And under what rules and what system. Understood, that's one piece of the equation. A second is a program of legalization, some kind of legal workers system, guest worker system, that allows people who are here or who we need to come here to work. Legalization, that's the word I use. Not citizenship, but legal status. Right. And then the third piece of immigration reform has been, yes, a path to citizenship. And these things sort of work together, all three. Path to citizenship is important because if you had just legalization, then what you would eventually have is an underclass of people who could be here as workers, but who wouldn't have rights as citizens. And we've never done that in American society before. We've had temporary guest worker programs like the Bracero program of the 1950s, but we've never had a permanent underclass in which we say, you're here, we need your labor, you function in our society somehow legally, but you can never be a citizen. So the Senate in June of year before last, 2012, passed a four-sided piece of legislation, bipartisanly, that had all three elements. It had border security, it had a legalization system, especially for the 12 million people who are here now undocumented, and everybody agrees, cannot be deported. There's no way to remove 12 million people from the country. We don't have enough buses, jails, detention centers to process 12 million people, so it's not an option. We've got to figure out some legalization structure, and yes, it included a path to citizenship, an onerous, difficult path to citizenship. In fact, it takes 13 years under the Senate provisions to get to citizenship after you have paid fines to acknowledge that you broke the law in getting here, after you've paid back taxes, after you've taken tests, including language tests, and after you've proven that you've been here for a period of time and been a, 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 a functioning member of the society in good standing. So it was a difficult legislation, but as I say, four-sided in the way it was balanced, one piece against the, the other, and, and workable. Not ideal, but workable. Unfortunately, in the time since two years ago, uh, the House has refused to act on any immigration reform. Uh, key members of the House committees have refused to move it. The House leadership has said they would only allow it on a piecemeal basis, uh, border security first, and then they've created all kinds of demands that the border be, quote, 100% secure, which every expert says is not accomplishable. You cannot get to the point where you can assure unreservedly that the border is 100% secure. So it's really when they take that position, a stance about going to the next level, which is some legalization program. So we have 12 million people living in the shadows, subject to deportation, doing the work we need them to do, but hiding to do it, right? And no path to citizenship. In fact, the House has been very adamant. Even if they passed the first two portions, they would never, ever, under any circumstances, pass a path to citizenship. They call it, and many of them, the previous step, legalization, they call it amnesty. And they will never be for anything that resembles anything like amnesty. Well, it's not amnesty because it involves fines and paying back taxes and a lot of other things. It's not amnesty, but yet it's the basis on which they oppose it. So we have this stalemate of stalemates. I mean, we're stalemated on a lot of things in our country, but on immigration reform, it is particularly acute and we're just stuck. Hence, the president has taken some actions independently, one of them which is 
was I, I'm, just, I'm still amazed at how many lives it has touched in profound ways, but it was the Deferred Action Initiative under his executive authority uh, taken last summer in which he allowed uh, young, uh, summer before last, in which he allowed young people who have been here for a number of years, uh, who are under a certain age, and who uh, came with their parents at a young age before it was their decision to come, but who have proven themselves in our schools or by joining our military to have a legal status so they could go to school without impediment and so forth. It's a wonderful thing. It, 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 it touched a potential million people and about 600,000 have been able to avail themselves of it. And last night in Fayetteville, the team took me to a community center to meet with immigrant families. And two of the people that I talked to, young mothers, one a dental technician with three children, is here because she fit under the so-called DACA guidelines, Deferred Action Guidelines, and is now legally working in the country under that, under that rubric. Beautiful story, beautiful family, beautiful person. I mean, it shows that, 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 that this is a real issue that touches people's lives, right? And because the Congress has not moved, the President now says he will take this up uh, on his own authority after the election and look at how that initiative can be expanded. Now, most experts would say, why don't we wait, not use executive authority, which doesn't get us the whole way we need to go, and wait on the Congress? And the answer is the Congress won't act, hasn't acted, has had multiple opportunities, and won't. And, and very little sense they will act in 2015. So the president is now saying, after the election, I'm going to look at some measures. And people believe it could include things like maybe changing some of the age for deferred action eligibility. That would add some people. Maybe adding the parents of those children, because now they have children who are here operating legally. That would add some people. And maybe providing some work permits for people who are here under those circumstances. So we'll see exactly what it is the president acts, but you can rest assured it's going to be exceedingly controversial. People will attack him. He's been threatened with being sued, being impeached if he goes down this road, but the Congress has not acted, and we've got millions of people living in difficult straits. Well, as I said, that is what we're talking about. We're talking about immigration reform. We're talking about laws. We're talking about technical procedures, and that's a valid conversation. But I'd like to, to, to wind down my remarks here and open the floor for questions by talking about what I think is the next most important subject after we get something done on the laws, and that is seriously addressing the integration of immigrants into our society. Immigra in integration has always been a difficult thing. If you read books like uh, Sinclair Lewis's The Jungle, you will read of the cruel uh, brutish life that immigrants from Eastern Europe lived in the stockyards of Chicago. And yet, it was a period in which America knew it needed the workers. So we created systems. Systems, I would argue, that don't exist today. We had unions that wanted the workers, political clubs that brought them turkeys at Thanksgiving, coal in the winter because they wanted their votes, churches that wanted them as parishioners for their churches. I was driving down the freeway in Chicago uh, a year or so ago and counted 15 church steeples within vision because every neighborhood had its own church, the Hungarian church, the Czechoslovakian church, the Polish church, uh, 15, 15 neighborhoods in Chicago. There was a sense of street life and, and, and bringing the immigrants, and we called it the Americanization of the immigrants. Today, that concept of Americanization is no longer popular, left or right. Right-wingers say, don't teach them English because then they'll want to stay. I actually heard that expressed in Tennessee. People on the left would say, we don't want to force American values on people. We don't believe in the melting pot. We believe in people keeping their own identity, and they look askance at ideas like assimilation. 
My view is we need to take back the concept of Americanization because it's exactly what we need to do. We need to help the immigrants find their way in the way America works, find their way through the labyrinth that is our society. And it strikes me that it's a two-way street. On the one hand, we have to create welcoming communities, which is what I'm so excited to see in Northwest Arkansas, which is why of all the places in the country we could have chosen to deploy these young people, our first cadre of Cisneros Fellows, we chose Northwest Arkansas because there's a community that for all the difficulties says we get it. We understand we've got a lot of people coming here because here's Walmart and here's Tyson's and here's J.B. Hunt, right? They're going to keep coming, not just Hispanics, but Marshall Island population, Hmong population, Ethiopian population, and others. Right? We're going to keep coming, and they're going to keep coming to other places like Northwest Arkansas. But in Northwest Arkansas, there seems to be a spirit, and we can find a way to make life better for them. I met with, for example, the mayor of Rogers, who used to be the police chief of Rogers. He follows a mayor who uh, demonized immigrants. He's now the congressman from that region. But as he was mayor, demonized immigrants, and the police chief says, I saw what that meant. It meant people wouldn't come forward and report crimes because they were afraid. It meant that we couldn't help them when they were in trouble and people could abuse them because they were afraid to come to their own police force. So the mayor has taken a decidedly different stance, which is to say, you know, we want to help people find their way in American society. I think it's critically important that we create welcoming communities. And there's a professor at the University of Arkansas, colleague of yours in, this, in service, Dr. Bill Schwab, who has done the definitive study on what are the elements of immigration in specifically Northwest Arkansas, the educational initiatives, the college accession, the workforce training, the language programs, the financial literacy, the small business strategies, the youth programs, the citizenship classes, the health initiatives, the protections against predatory practices that a welcoming, welcoming community would put in place. And what we're working to do at, the, at our center is to identify those things we can do in a place like Northwest Arkansas, but also in Georgia, where workers go for the textile industry, in North Carolina, where they go to work in furniture, in Tennessee, where they work in transportation-related industries. We've been invited to go to Missouri, Virginia, Northern California, Eastern Washington, all places where there are large numbers of immigrants, but little of an infrastructure, little of a services support system to help them make it in American life. So one side of the equation is what communities do. The other side of the equation is what immigrants have to do for themselves. And it was a, it was a wonderful experience for me last night. Eye-opening, moving, I would say, moved to the point of goosebumps to talk to people and, and ask them, how's it going for you? Some of them are legal. They've been legalized one way or the other, like the woman I described under deferred action, and others of them are undocumented. But they're working in a freezing plant, freezing chickens for Tyson's, or they're working in a manufacturing operation making hand wipes, et cetera, all up in Northwest Arkansas. And when you ask them questions like, you know, what's the toughest thing about life for you? They describe mother and father both working, trying to get extra hours to make more money, and just the difficulty of trying to make ends meet on low wages, okay? Real life. Ask them, how do you relate to your children's teachers and understand the American school system? And they say, very hard, because the children can learn English pretty quickly, but it's real hard to learn English as adults. It's just a hard language to learn with all the rules of the, of, 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 the, of the language. So they have a hard time connecting with their children's teachers. Now we're talking practical things. We're talking about how people live and advance. So this Cisnero Center is a result of about 10 years of thinking about this on a group, part of a group of us. 
And we've come up with a kind of a life plan for people that speaks to the following things. I won't go into it. I'll just kind of tick off some of them. But the life plan says things like, I will learn English in addition to my native language. I will learn the traditions and civic life of this country in order that I can eventually be a good citizen in America and operate according to the understandings of the society on things like rule of law, etc. I will develop my own skills so I can make a living for my family, but I'll also begin to think about beyond income, savings. So retirement, insurance, health care, college education, the things that Americans save for, for the future, right? I will, I will learn how American parents relate to the schools so that my children can get an opportunity in school, and I will establish college or higher education as an expectation in my home. I will work on things like nutrition and health care so that my family can be safe, etc., and a number of other kind of practical points. Right? And they all fall under the general rubric that goes something like this. I will carry my home country in my heart, but I understand now that I am here. I commit to the obligations of life in the United States, how to advance my family, how to contribute to the society. That's the big picture. That's the, the overarching logic, if you will. It has a couple of assumptions in it. One of them is, I'm probably not going back. I may have come here to work with the thought that I would eventually go back, but life intervenes. Now I have a wife. Now I have children. I'm probably not going back. I'm here, so I've got to figure it out, how it works here, how I contribute here. There's, as I say, there's assumptions embedded in this logic that it's possible to learn the American way. We know it is. It's possible to learn the language. We know it is. It's positive to pass it on to the next generation. We know it is. So that's the debate that I think America needs to have. And to me, it's a fairly straightforward result of that debate. We need to do a better job at integrating these folks, 12 million who are here undocumented to start with, and then their children, and then generations of others, so that even though our country is aging, and we're going through the same demographic pattern as other places, right? we are going to have that infusion of young talent. And it's going to be committed to the same principles of how we build this country. And it is a population that brings ambition and energy and, 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 and a, a readiness to commit to the American future. So you ask me, am I optimistic about the American future? I am, because I know these people. I know these people. I saw, their, I saw their faces last night. Eyes focused, aware, questioning, striving, passionate about learning what they can to make a difference. This is a great, great asset for our country. We just need to figure out how to make it work for us. Thank you very much for the opportunity to come over here. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Let's uh, have a few questions and wait for the microphones. Melvin, we'll wait. We'll get it <clears throat> to you. Melvin, back at the back. Well, thank you, Secretary Cisnero. Um, I'm a student here at the Clinton School, and I'm taking a class, Elections 2014, and we've discussed um, President Obama's waiting until after the midterm elections to move on immigration reform and I just wanted to know first what your um, what your opinion is that the implica implications will be on the 2016 election and also where do you draw the line between integration and assimilation okay first um, though um, my hope was that that the, the Congress would act and I serve as uh, a co-chair of a bipartisan task force in Washington that, that includes such disparate people as myself and Governor Rendell, who was chairman of the Democratic Party on the Democratic side, and Condoleezza Rice, who was Secretary of State to President Bush, and 
Haley Barber, who was the governor of Mississippi and chairman of the Republican Party. And by the way, he is very good on this subject. He may be the most valuable player of our task force uh, because he gets it. He understands the work piece of this, the business argument for this. But we've got a bipartisan effort underway that has been working for the last two years in trying to get the Congress to act. So we thought we had a window in early 2014 before the election, the primaries began. We thought there was a window after the primaries, uh, but it's become very, very political. And perhaps the decisive moment of 2014 was when Eric Cantor lost his election in Virginia, and it was blamed on the fact that he's not hard right on immigration, but left some wiggle room on immigration, and it's that that they attacked him on. Turns out the election probably wasn't decided on that subject, but in any event, immigration has gotten the blame, and the Republican House leaders essentially said, can't go there, period, no way, and that ended it for 2014. So at that point, immigration advocates began to say, the president's got to do this on his own. And the House leader said, don't even think about it. If you do, we'll sue. If you do, we'll start impeachment proceedings. This is a president who violates the law and can't be trusted, was their line. So it got to be a very, very tough set of choices for the president. As a Latino and as a person who sees people suffering daily in communities, I would have loved for the president to be able to act. But I understood when he didn't. And in fact, got in some little difficulty with my own community when I tried to explain on Spanish television and other mediums why it was all right that he didn't. And my logic essentially is two things. One, it would have so absorbed the oxygen in this election cycle that we wouldn't have had another discussion but immigration and probably lost a handful of Senate seats in the process in close states like Louisiana, Arkansas, North Carolina, Montana, Iowa, and other places where this issue would have been the anchoring issue, the anchor that pulls people down. So I get it. As I've, I've been around enough politics, <clears throat> had to run for office myself, that I, I get it. Furthermore, I could make another argument, which is if the result had been to lose the Senate on this issue, to lose the Senate, then a Republican House and a Republican Senate in the next session would be so petrified of this issue that there's little chance to get any action on immigration. So it's a hard matter to explain to advocates who are suffering and want action, but I think I can justify the decision. Now, I've been in several settings in recent weeks where the president says, with no reservations, no escape language, I will act. I will act before the end of the year to do what I can within my authority. So I've got to believe that's going to happen. 2016, to go to your question, is a different proposition uh, because, uh, first of all, there's different states in play, right? And secondly, there's a presidential election. And on the presidential map, immigration plays differently than it does in individual states like Louisiana or Arkansas or North Carolina. Now you're talking about electoral votes in the country at large. And if the Latino community is mobilized on this issue, as it was in 2008 for President Obama, then states that are not normally Democratic, like Virginia, like Colorado, can get there in the big turnout year of a presidential year, right? So the Republicans have to be very, very careful that they don't drive a permanent wedge between them and the Latino community because they'll, they'll push themselves to the point where they cannot be a presidential party. They might win congressional elections, but they can't win a presidential election when 54 votes in California is taken off the table, when Florida becomes reliably Democratic because the Latino vote is there, because when marginal states, like I mentioned Colorado and Virginia, are put into the blue pot, and then you go on across the map, uh, can't win a presidential election. So it is a, it's a big issue. And, the, and, and smart, thoughtful, foresighted Republicans, both operatives as well as office holders like Rand Paul are saying, we gotta do something about this, folks. We gotta clean up our act here, or we're gonna, we're gonna put ourselves in the same position that Pete Wilson, governor of California, put California in, which is 
it will always be blue on these issues because he, he drove such a wedge in the 1990s and alienated the Latino community that it will not, it simply won't listen to a Republican appeal anymore, all right? So that's the way it relates to 16. Your final point was assimilation versus integration. Um, I, th I see integration as more of the, the mechanical processes of education, financial literacy, uh, personal advancement, etc. Assimilation tends to be a more cultural concept. Uh, I, I, uh, assimilation has gotten a bad name in recent years uh, as people think that it means having to give up your heritage and uh, you know, sort of lose your identity uh, and assimilate into every aspect of the American cultural milieu. Uh, and maybe that is what assimilation means. Uh, if that's what it means, I'm not for it, because I think it's possible to keep one's identity and be a good American. Uh, God gave us minds that allow us to learn English and not have to push out the Spanish we know. Every day we learn something new, and it's not at the expense of what we already know. It's additive. And I see this as an additive proposition, where you're adding the America, what you know and learn about the American life. These people last night, I was surprised. I'd never heard this before. I asked them, you know, what surprises you about life in the country? And they said, the laws are different. They're intuitively different than in their home countries, somehow. Uh, and and uh, uh, the laws in the workplace, for example, that they, they run afoul of because it's not what their intuition tells them should be the laws. So uh, you try to add a level of understanding, but kind of keep your own identity. I think that's the difference between integration as I see it and an assimilation that requires you to kind of give up your culture. Not, ne not necessary. Whatever I said stimulated some hands because there were one earlier and now there's about five. <laughs> Good afternoon, Secretary Cisneros, welcome Thank to you. Rock. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, I grew up in San Antonio, Texas. Wonderful. Um, when you were mayor there, mm. I feel you made a mention of uh, you, you notice how old she made me. She grew up when I was mayor. <laughs> you mentioned immigrants coming here and just another <laughs> world. From San Antonio moving here, I almost felt like I was in another world. Um, I guess instead of going on, I have taught at Hall High School. I've taught in the Little Rock School District for almost nine years. And much of my time spent at Hall, which is one of the greatest ESL, I guess, schools here within this district. I, my question to you, because I understand, my heart goes to the Latinos because I know, I know, I have no family that is that, but they are my family. At a grassroots level, I think the core is an understanding that people need to come to that have not seen or felt the heritage, the culture. And Americans, we have our own. Mm -hmm. um, however, this is a wonderful people mm -hmm. that can bring what you say, mm -hmm. jobs, family. Sure. Uh, just I believe that. So much. So at a grassroots level, how can we best do that? Well, that's a great point. I, I believe that, and I think at some level, Americans understand it. And, um, uh, and we just need to kind of be exposed more to the realities of the culture. A friend of mine went to Germany a few years ago, and after several glasses of wine late night over dinner, his German host said to him, you Americans are so blessed, you don't know how good you have it. You're your immigrants are so much like you. And this fellow was sort of blown away because you know the, the emphasis here is on the differences. But in Germany, where they're trying to deal with immigrants from Turkey and the fit is not good, and in Germany there is no immigrant tradition, and in Germany, until a few years ago, you couldn't ever be a German unless you had German blood. 
in the United States, we don't have that concept of what defines you as an American. What defines you as an American is the laws you're willing to accept, the traditions you're willing to accept. So he, this person said to him, you know, you, you guys are fortunate. Your, your immigrants are so much like you. Well, what he meant was there's a kind of Western Judeo-Christian ethic of similarity that relates to the way we perceive family obligations, perceive work, perceive faith, et cetera, that's, very, that, that's really, really quite positive and bonding if we look at the similarities, not the differences. And so it's really important to work at trying to expose people to the nature of the culture. I will tell you this, and I hope I'm not saying this because I am Latino, but I'm around these folks, and I'm a fairly, you know, experienced judge of people and culture and differences. And what I see in these folks, I'm, I, I, again, I hope I'm not being overly sympathetic, but what I see is people who really want to work and really want to uh, contribute and really want good things for their families and are willing to sacrifice today so the next generation can have more better, uh, more later. Uh, and, and we just, as I said, we need to figure out how to harness that and make it work for this country because it's there to be done. Yes, ma'am, right here. The red shirt, right here. <clears throat> thank you for coming to Arkansas, and thank you for investing in Northwest Arkansas. I hope that all of us are bothered in some ways by the new industry of border security because it's very hard to unring a bell. I hope that some of that will go away with the, the guns and, and violence at our borders, or rather, on one border. But what I would like to ask is, your commitment to Northwest Arkansas, how long are you committed to staying in the community to make a difference? Well, our, our, uh, there are various ways we could have proceeded, and my colleagues persuaded me, the founders and the board members, that the right model for us was to take fellows, take the bright, young, talented young people that I described earlier, and put them into the community and give them the following assignment. First of all, find out what the community needs, what the immigrants themselves say they need, right? Secondly, find out what exists in terms of services, and, and let's determine where the gaps are, English programs that are not sufficient, for example, or teacher and parent initiatives that need to be organized. So let's find out where the gaps, realistic gaps are, and or bulk up things that do exist that somebody's already doing, but we need more of. So let's get outside resources and apply them there. Our objective is to leave things permanently in place that wouldn't have happened if we weren't there. Right? Can that be done in a year? No, clearly not. So our hope is a year, two years, three years, with the present group of fellows or replacements for them if life intervenes and they have to move on, but a commitment for a span of time. A part of the answer also relies on is there financial support within the community to keep it going? Walmart has supported us. Others in the region, uh, uh, Walton family and foundations and so forth. Uh, so, so, you know, do people care enough? Are we making enough of a difference to keep it going? But I think this is something that should continue for a number of years, and I, I don't want to say indefinitely, uh, because at some point then you're just, you know, sort of making work as opposed to making a difference. But um, I think it's something that we want to do for a span of time. We also have to balance against that, that we want to go to other places. And I will tell you this, one of the points that I've tried to make up in Northwest Arkansas that I think has resonated with some of the leadership is, imagine Northwest Arkansas as the prototype for the country of how a growth, a rural community that's growing into urban addresses this question and becomes a model for how you integrate immigrants. Because that same model can play out in 100, 500 places across America where we need it. At the local level. I know there are a lot of questions for, for, for the Secretary, uh, but we're, we're, we've run out of time. I encourage you to come visit with him personally uh, as we leave. <coughs> Please join me in thanking the Secretary for being with us.